So today we will talk about research assessments and um, what comes and doesn't come with it. I'm here today with Karen Strobans and Naomi Albert Bonn. And um, yeah, so who basically bring a lot of expertise and experience into the topic. Welcome, Karen and Naomi. Thank you. Thank you. So to get us started, could each of you um, briefly introduce yourselves and um, how you got into the topic of um, yeah, conceptualizing around research assessment, working at the projects that you're currently working at and why that's so important to you to engage in. And who would like to start? Maybe Karen? Yeah, I'm happy to start. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm Karen Strubans and um, I'm currently doing actually a few things. I manage a bit of a portfolio. One of them is uh, I'm a policy advisor for the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, and leading actually a small team on research innovation policy, but I'm also doing a side of that, a bit of freelance consultancy, and that is really focused around research culture. And then also uh, since December, I'm the vice chair of the coalition for uh, reforming research assessment. Um, and um, all those things kind of relate to each other around the topic of research culture. It's also part of my job at RSC, and I think the way I got into that topic is uh, as a researcher, actually. So I started my career mm -hmm. as a researcher, as a wow. PhD in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I got a bit disappointed initially with how, what kind of the focus was of um, progressing in your career as a scientist. I was part uh, as a PhD student of an organization in Flanders at the time. I re I'm originally from Belgium where we were trying to convince the Flemish government to actually change the way that they were allocating budgets to the different Flemish universities, uh, because they were already relying on metrics and publication-based indicators. And that was really the start of my interest in um, first actually research assessment at the institutional level. But then um, I did continue as a researcher for some time, came actually to Cambridge in the UK, where I'm based now, to do a postdoc and still also saw a lot of the issues. And then I decided uh, after my postdoc to actually change to a career in policy. Uh, and my first experience there was at the Royal Society, where I was working on a pro pro project around research culture. And that's really set the tone of the rest of my career because it kind of re invigorated some of the ideas I had when I was in Belgium and it's it's um it's a topic I've found interesting and really important as a, a researcher but also now as a as a policy professional uh, because I feel we're not getting the best from scientists at the moment because of the way the system is set up incentivized because of systematic uh, barriers I think also to things like inclusion to um, the effects that that has on, on integrity as well uh, but I also have an interest more generally in, in success and what success means, because I think also at a more much wider level, if we think about, uh, for example, the use of GDP to, to measure the success of nations, it's almost similar to what we do with the impact factor. It's a metric that doesn't say much, um, that doesn't include everything, uh, but that we've kind of come to use to define success around. So I'm also interested in that broader picture around how we measure success. And I think somewhere I'm also hoping that if we can solve or address that problem to some extent within academia, maybe that will also give clues for solutions on those broader levels. Um, so that's maybe kind of a few of the things around my motivation uh, on the topic, um, but also curious to hear uh, Noemi's version. Yeah, thank you so much. And I I will happily take you up on the question around what is how can we measure success and what does success mean in a research context? And that's probably also to be answered quite individually by the respective researchers on the project level. But before we come to that, um Noemi, please. <laughs> thank you. So um a bit like Karen, I think I am in this domain because I got somewhat disappointed with how research works, how academia works. So I am uh, originally from Quebec in Canada. I studied uh, cognitive neuroscience 
I did a bachelor's and a master's in that topic. And uh, as I was going on with my studies, I realized that the main focus of my education was to publish papers. So I was asked a lot of things and I, I built a lot of skills as a researcher, but the only thing that really mattered for my future was how many papers I had on my CV, how many of them I was a first author. Um, and th that really disappointed me. So I decided to uh, take a sidetrack. I thought it would be just for a few years, but it ended up uh, lasting much longer than that. And I uh, explored uh, different, uh, why the system is like this. So I first uh, worked in uh, publication ethics uh, as a scientific editor for a, a little bit. Uh, for a few months, and then I did a master's of bioethics looking at research integrity. So research integrity is uh, really interested in how researchers conduct research, uh, also in research misconduct, uh, in um, falsification of data, and things like that. And that led me to the conclusion that researchers, of course, there are some researchers that uh, falsify data voluntarily, uh, they, 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 they want to reach the top and and they cheat the system a little bit but most um research integrity failures in science are happening because researchers are not evaluated appropriately because they're asked things that are not relevant for the quality and the integrity of science and to survive in their career they have to do things that um do not value good science so this is what led me to then work in uh, research assessments. Uh, and I did my PhD on that topic, looking at the impact on re of research assessments on research um, integrity, on research practices, uh, through qualitative research, through interviews, surveys, and et cetera. And uh, after my PhD, then I worked uh, as a postdoc. So I was on a European Commission project uh, called SUPS 4RI, which looks at um, making, it wants to make a tool for research institution to um, better promote research integrity. And part of that was on making better research environments, including better research assessment. So that's uh, where I focused most of my efforts. I'm also a postdoc in Hasselt University, and I'm since recently also a policy advisor with Research England UKRI. Uh, in England. Right, and um, UKRI is also the UK network um, or agency for research in integrity, right? Just um, to... It's a, it's a re UK research and innovations. No, no, I think no, you're exactly. probably thinking of UK oh. RIO. There's yeah. a lot of acronyms that are very yeah. similar. <laughs> England right. is very Let me easy. clarify that, thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so when we think about research assessment and um, re maybe, yeah, in a way also revolutionizing the same or changing it to more towards quality oriented, what many of us and many of the listeners probably come across is Dora. And you're both also involved and engaged in um, QARA, which is an acronym for, please help me out, C O. ARA research Coalition for advancing research yeah. assessment. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I've listened to you guys on a webinar with a uh, um Remo, um the researchers um oh the health observatory, mental health observatory where where you presented basically the planned work for Carrara, which builds up on Dora in a way, or is also or an independent and yet integrated um, follow-up from Dora, where Dora is basically calling for commitment for a change of research assessment, um, more towards quality orientation, and Quara is now facilitating the actual implementation at institutional levels. Is that right so far? So um so I think Dora is already I think celebrating its 10th year anniversary um, and um, they've done really a lot, I think, to create awareness around changes to research assessment. Um, I think Kowara is really building a bit on 
uh, on Dora, but also on the fact that there's been, I think, renewed momentum for this agenda, also in the context of, I think, people also at the political level realizing that um, if we want to also make progress on the agendas around open science, around inclusion and diversity, the assessment system is actually forming a barrier. So the coalition was really born from, uh, I think, increased momentum with funders in Europe, with the political level in Europe saying, OK, we we really want to, to do something to progress that agenda. And so the first step in that was a consultation by the actually by the European Commission of stakeholders across Europe. Uh, the, the second step was to actually formulate an agreement uh, that is I would say building on Dora, but going further. So it it actually, um, Dora was very focused initially around uh, not using the impact factor. Uh, the 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 agreement of the of the coalition goes a step further and also sets a time frame for action. And I think that's something that's really new. Um, and then uh, that's something actually where where Noemi and I were were very very much involved in 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 getting that agreement uh, drafted and and also the co-creation with all the different organizations who are interested in that. Um, and then the the third step, which is the kind of phase we're now in, was then in December the launch of a coalition to actually implement that agreement uh, that indeed builds on Dora, but it it does go a bit further. Um, and that's kind of where we're where we're at now. So the the coalition has been launched. I think we have around four hundred members now, um, and um, and now there's you know the 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 board the the steering board has now a task to um, kind of ensure that that momentum continues and and that that initiative can really see the implementation uh, of the agreement. And how how do you work with institutions like how is as much as you have inside or an, engaged in these parts of the work that Quora is doing because um i'm sure there's several levels where yes. it's um and then also for the implementation part like is it that that then for okay the Quora members would is there like webinars or, or meetings that are being facilitated where best practices are being shared and trying to come up with standards for assessments? So in the initial phase, um, we had these big assembly meetings. Um, so that was really for, for uh, creating the agreement itself. Um, so we did, there was also a survey, but there, in, in the meetings itself, there was also breakout groups to, to kind of get the opinions of all the different stakeholders. And just to say that actually since the start, it actually went to something that has the aspiration to be global. So it's not only organizations from Europe uh, that were involved in that. Um, now that the coalition is set up, there's actually still a lot that needs to be worked out of how members will be able to engage. There definitely will already, as one central part, be the option of um, members engaging via working groups and the process for applying for those and how those will work is actually being being developed at the moment. Um, but we're also thinking about creating some kind of forum where people will be able to share resources and interact. Um, but I must say a lot of that is still really in a development phase. So. Um, yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll need to see in the next months how how that develop develops. And understandably so, if we only think about the diversity of research topics and challenges and um, approaches it, within one discipline and one um, field of study. Really, um, there's there's several also again levels to look at where assessment can happen. Um, but yeah. But no me, not no me, sorry. <laughs> oh would you like to add? Otherwise I have another question maybe to address to you. Uh yeah, well, go ahead. You okay, the question. the question then. So what where have you seen opportunities to measure quality versus quantity? If we want to or what are other quantitative measures that we can take into account other than obviously the impact factor and the, the number of articles. Um, given the high diversity in research output and questions and answers being generated by the various researchers and scientists. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a very good question. I think one that is not um, really resolved at the moment, but that we are building consensus. Well, 
we know that the system right now, it's not necessarily the, the, the way that it's measured, but it's the limited number of things that we look at mm -hmm. and how these things are not showing the whole picture of what's happening. Um, so we look at number of publication, we look at journal impact factor, and that gives us very little information about how the research was done. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really dependent on luck. I mean, uh, it it doesn't really tell us anything about yeah the 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 project the research the researchers um the openness of the science and the integrity of the science mm -hmm. um and this is where the problem starts so we have very few indicators they're very limited and they're also if you look at how they're calculated for example the impact factor they're there are problems as well in how it is calculated in the validity of the impact factor for showing what we think it shows, which is impact. But impact through the impact factor is a very different meaning than what we think of impact. So that's the problem and where it starts. And most people now agree that we have a problem there. How do we then move beyond that to measure something that shows us more information about the quality of the research? Well, one of the main points that is happening right now is that we realize that quality um, is not necessarily uh, quantifiable. Uh, so we're moving towards more qualitative indicators, towards more uh, indicators that provide more variety. So the researchers have more room to say why their project matters, why their career matters, and um, they have more it's more open for different elements uh, that create their career paths. Not everyone has the same career path. Not everything that researchers do matters in the same way. Um, and we leave more room for that. Um, I could go on and on, but maybe Karen wants to yeah. join me in on yeah, this. Yeah, I, I mean, I can add to that. Obviously, I agree with everything Noemi <laughs> just said. But I think um, one of the things we are also, I think, trying to kind of come back from is whether we've in the past maybe conflated certain metrics with quality where that is, that's not really what they, they tell us about. So a question I've often asked in conversations around the use of quantitative versus qualitative indicators is, um, are we measuring productivity or are we measuring quality? Because if you want to measure something that's a quantity, it makes more sense to use a quantitative measure. Whereas if it's quality you want to measure, it would make sense to use qualitative measures. I mean, it's in the terminology for, for, mm -hmm. for a, I think, a logical reason. So I think that kind of really resonates with what Noemi just said, that there is now, I think, a tendency um, to move more to thinking about, okay, what are qualitative indicators we can use if it is really quality that we want to measure. That doesn't mean that there is never a merit in measuring productivity or performance, but I, I think we need to be clear that, that that in those instances, that is what we're looking at and not conflating the two, which I think we are we are often doing at the moment. So, um, and, and again, also agreeing with the fact that it's also about broadening it's also about taking into account more different things. So uh, part of my route into it, as I said, was working on the on the program, um, the research culture program at the Royal Society. And a big outcome from that program was that uh, a lot of the issues with research culture and all the topics that sit under it, um, if you look at kind of what is central to a lot of those research, it is the incentive system. It is a combination of very, very narrow kind of definitions of how we define success, uh, as well as a very competitive um, environment. And I think that that relates more maybe to precarity and the way the funding system is set up. But so the incentive system is one of the things to change if you want to improve the culture. That was one of the findings. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I worked on when I was at the Royal Society was the development of the narrative CV that then later on was adopted by uh, UKRI. And this indeed is a way to actually do a more qualitative assessment. So it's very much in line with that movement towards more qualitative forms of assessment that can include a lot more things than the, the, the things we look at at the moment. So um, yeah, very much in line really with, with what Noemi just said. Can you just um, say a few words uh, what the narrative CV entails other than the tabula? Is it like, yeah, 
what did you add as components to make it more informative? And what, yeah, what so added? yeah, so the narrative CV, but I think yeah, Noemi might want to add in because I think she also knows a lot <laughs> about narrative CVs. So the narrative CV is really um a, a space kind of giving space to uh and to a narrative giving space to a more qualitative formulation oh, okay. of what researchers think is valuable of the things that they've done and so it was the initial one i think we've left lots of space for people to adapt it tweak it use the elements that they find useful but the initial one uh, i have to think now was structured around four four big contributions that you can make the first one was really contributions to knowledge generation, science, so the very core um, of it. It did, I think it did stipulate where you would talk about publications to only mention the DOI and so not any any metrics, but also gave it gave a lot of examples of other things you could talk about. The second uh, layer was, um, I think, contributions to the development of people around you. So that could be mentoring, it could be working with PhD students, but it could also be supporting people senior to you. So, you know, all directions, the people directly around you. And then the third level was contributions you make to the scientific community more broadly. So that could be things like peer review, organizing a conference, all those kind of things to make sure those are taken into account. And then the final level was your contributions to wider society. So that could be where maybe you have examples of, of impact for society, but it could also include outreach and engagement directly with, uh, for example, patients when you're in medical research. Of course. So those, yeah, those were kind of the four levels and then there were lots of examples given to really inspire people on the kind of things they could talk about but also with clearly an indication as part of the framework say you know no one is expecting you to do all the things that um, are listed here you know we need to also go i think a bit away from this um, um, expectation that every academic does, does absolutely everything that they could you know do and i think there's also a danger um with metrics that people feel like they need to tick every box so i think and it's my hope at least we need to uh, we are already using it and evaluating it but i think there's more work to be done um i do hope it will help with ensuring people feel they can focus on one aspect of that of that big big area and not feel like they need to tick every single box yeah because like the biggest objection i often hear when it comes to purpose why are you doing this research and what's the societal impact all the researchers, including myself, who work in basic research just for you know acquiring knowledge's sake, um, usually have difficulties with answering their questions. Like, oh, I don't know why it might be applied eventually, but this is what I'm curious about for now, and just because I don't see any bigger purpose in it. But even for those, and then that took me a while actually to discover. It's only throughout the PhD or later, the more you advance in the career, that you are also more and more capable of seeing the big, bigger picture and how this might eventually influence also policy making or societal impact in whatever sense or solving climate change. I don't know that which at the beginning of your research endeavor, no matter how old you are, but you know, when you're still early in in the into the topic, might not be foreseeable necessarily. And for that, I agree with you. It's not probably not necessary to tick all the boxes. But to to have space to explain why I as a researcher find this worthwhile to pursue as a research question or a research topic and yeah, and why it should matter to whom and and mm -hmm. what Noemi. If I can add to that, um so there is a one one of the big aspects of the narrative C V and one of the things that I think I like the most is that it's really not focused on quantity. So the other CVs, you would have a list of publications, but mm -hmm. in most narrative CVs, not all of them, but most of them, they limit you on how many publications you can put on how many contributions you talk about. So it's really about you reflecting on the content mm -hmm. of what you put in there. So it's, about a reflection of some of your contributions and explaining why they matter to you. So it gives a better idea of who you are as a scientist, what matters to you, um, what areas you find important. So like you mentioned about outreach and about contribution to society, 
some people are really good at at that and they really want to focus on that too without necessarily being so involved in the first steps of the research they they are good at bringing research out in the open bringing it in the field uh, testing implementing piloting it mm-hmm. um well these people are able to write that in an narrative cv but there's fewer publications coming out of these type of research um projects where it's mostly in the field uh, applications and and um but in real life so i think it just opens the door to more variety less hyper productivity without meaning and uh, yeah and and then like additionally or maybe before even journal publications like i i deal with preprints quite a bit and to me a preprint is already like a, something should be equivalent to a journal publication because often it has like the biggest difference that's that's being discussed is oh it has an undergone peer review which i would object because normally it has undergone rigorous peer review in the in the smaller circles i mean we don't need to go into the do's and don'ts and what ifs of preference generally but where i want to what i want to address to you now and also of course you can have opinion and voice it also here <laughs> um but is is the redesign of how we have scholarly series nowadays and forthcoming also incorporating discussions not not discussions but listing research output in different forms as in not only the journal articles and if those are mentioned then i would argue for and some of my colleagues in the past have done that not to mention the venue where it's been published but but um just giving the doi and the title and the co-authors and that should be enough unfortunately some of the uis also have uh have the actual name of the publisher in it which then can also again play to uh lead to prestige building um, and and judgments and assessments based on prestige um, qualifiers, but but also listing all the conferences, well, that's not the conference if you didn't end it, but um, conference proceedings, uh, researchers contributed to or data sets that were published separately, not results that have been shared in a repository. Um, and also with their respective DOIs, because that's when um, what the purpose of the CV is to a future employer or a, a funder or yeah whatever consortium who looks at it can then directly verify the information given through the DOI, actually look at the data and then have a coherent assessment of the person with their achievements beyond the mere journal publishing. Am I going too far? Or I can maybe start with that one. I mean, it's first of all on peer review, I think this could be a whole new uh episode. Peer review, peer review reports is also a thing that's emerging now to be yeah. more, more pushed, which yeah. And so within so within the agreement, we did put peer review as one of still one of the central ways of, of assessing because it, it does allow for a more qualitative assessment. Uh, but I think equally recognizing that uh, there are issues with peer review and, and that in itself needs to be looked at, but that's maybe even a, you know an, another piece that fits within the bigger assessment piece as one area to really look at. Yeah. In terms of what CV should look at, yes, I, I do think it's indeed around um, being able to capture other outputs, but not only outputs, also just more around the research process about uh, the competencies that people have. Because, you know, you say, okay, what are people looking yeah. for in a CV? And I have a very different experience outside academia versus inside academia. Yeah. My academic CV has been absolutely useless to apply for jobs outside you know, people have told me when I was using initially the academic CV, this says nothing about your skills. No. It only, it's completely outputs oriented. It doesn't tell me anything about how you operate as a person, what your key skills are, what competencies you have. Mm-hmm. And there's a question around how useful it is within academia. You know, does it really tell us how how um, well placed a person is for a job for recruitment? Does it tell us whether they will be able to manage a big research group? 
um, how well they will do in collaborations, which is essential to 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 many of the research we do uh, mm. now. So I, I do have questions around even there are people who are suggesting still a kind of outputs and metrics based CV, but that includes a lot more things, you know, a number of how many open science publications, a number of how many, I don't know, engagements you've had with uh, the general public. My my take on it is I don't want to end up with a much longer list of numbers. Mm. I think that is really the opposite of the direction we should go in. I just don't think it will be helpful. Mm. Um, and, and I think there is a danger in, in going in that direction because it's what we're used to within the academic um, landscape. So I've already seen proposals of an indicator for um outreach and public engagement mm -hmm. um start counting how many open open uh, access publications you have start counting how many open data sets you have i mean if you really think about it and reflect on it what does that really tell you mm. not an awful lot it, it doesn't really so yeah. i really think well, we yeah, need to carries it carries the same possible misconducts like salami slicing and whatnot um, yeah, exactly. I so it's yeah, I, I do think that's a trap if we go there. Yeah, so I'm I'm really going more towards the quality, but you know, not everyone will agree with me. There are people who really think that that is the direction. I've heard it in in very kind of uh the really defending metrics on everything. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think that's a direction, but um I think as Noemi started the conversation. I think these are all things we're working through as at the moment as a community, and there's quite a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah, and if I can add to that, so one of the big things that brings us back a little bit, and that's very difficult to solve, is if you have very different profiles of researchers and, and you allow for that and you understand that they're very different, they have different skills, they have... Uh, different roles in their teams, uh, different types of outputs, it's very difficult to compare them. And that's where we're still struggling and we still have a lot of work to do on how how to make decisions when we have a lot of profiles because uh, we know that in science there are many scientists, many excellent scientists, and I, I don't like to work, use the word excellence, but, <laughs> but there are many really highly skilled uh highly uh, passionate scientists and not so much funding so we have to make decisions and this is why it, a lot of people push for metrics but at the same time we know that the metrics can be damaging and they're not showing the full picture and they have issues um, there are um, efforts to create new metrics um, for partly for these reasons and there are efforts to embrace more um, the subjectivity of qualitative data, understanding that all assessments are subjective in a way, even though you use metrics, you have number, you have an impression of objectivity, but it, it's all subjective in the end. So there's these two um, views that we still need to work out a little bit. And I think that's for the future, hopefully the near future. Yeah, and I think one thing that's also sometimes forgotten is, Yes, you know, if you go to qualitative, it is more work. I think we need to be very honest about that. But there is a question about frequency of assessment. Yeah. I think researchers are probably one of the most assessed professionals if you compare it across all sectors and all different professions that exist. So I do think there is a question about are we over assessing in terms of frequency? Is there a balance to strike where maybe solving the issue of um, capacity is not about, okay, let's do something that's easy via metrics that can be done fast and we don't need as much capacity of researchers. Or can we say, no, we, we do think qualitative is the way to go, but perhaps we don't need to evaluate as often as we do. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's maybe something as well that is um, perhaps not so much part of the discussion yet, but maybe should be in the future. I think it also, I mean, there's also pressure from the because much research is publicly funded, which means taxpayers. So the government has accountability to the taxpayers and the researchers have accountability towards the policymakers. And that needs to balance. And then there's um, like expensive research or high throughput research, like in the STEM sciences, physics, as, as what is it like? Astronomics, um, bioscience is all 
highly expensive research and high throughput also, and as also the bulk of research is being performed across the world, I guess, mm -hmm. or in the anyway. So where most of the finance, financial resources go. So in that sense, to make sure that the money is well spent or efficiently spent, which is highly questionable with the current assessment system, I agree. But I think that's the argument for, yes, we need some sort of metrics. But I'd like to bring in the term slow science, which I've come across only recently, I think about two years ago, and I haven't really digged into it. But from how I thought um, before I started, um, even my studies, or maybe in my studies, and then towards master's level, and then engaging on the, working on the PhD, I thought being a scientist is fun. And then there's also things like academic freedom. You have a liberty in designing your research results. You have a, yes, a timeline, but it's not as not as strict as we find it in industry research. So not as rigorous. So yeah, um, I don't know. Do you want to comment on that? It's not that I have a specific question, but the the concept of slow science, I think, also allows for more quality orientation in the research design and then also the later the assessment versus having to publish as soon as possible and as many as, as possible papers. So it's basically the contradictory approach. I I mean, I first I want to go back to one of the points you mentioned just before talking mm -hmm. about slow science that we have an accountability to taxpayers and and we probably need metrics to showcase that accountability i think so i when you said that i i agree i hear that very often uh, but there's two points on this so first we think that the metrics are the way to show accountability that they're the way to show progress but maybe there are other ways and we're discovering that there really are other ways right now mm -hmm. metrics might be useful on a very big aggregate level, on a country level, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that you have to impose that on researchers. And I know it normally, if you assess a country based on publication numbers, then you assess institutions based on publication numbers, then institutions will assess their researchers based on publication numbers. So there's a risk there, but I think we also have to realize at which level mm. uh, the metrics are necessary at which level they are useful and where whether they really are necessary in, in themselves, whether they really are enough and et cetera. So that's just one point, not on slow science. Yeah, no, thanks yeah. for adding that. And I totally agree. It's not that I wanted to to push for that argument, just to mention that it's probably the only way that many people see that we currently have to assess. But I agree mm -hmm. it shouldn't be on the individual researchers level, more on a kind of higher yeah. yeah, and I think actually in the, the NORCAM tool, um, which is uh, one of the kind of, I think, good practice examples we have for um, putting putting this more qualitative assessment in, in, in practice at the moment, there's a very nice graph of where to use quantitative versus qualitative um, indicators, and it does really change with the aggregate level. So if you're looking at an individual, it's kind of fully on qualitative. And when you look at uh, the biggest aggregate, which is indeed countries, it's kind of more on the metric level and it kind of uh, changes with the levels in between. Um, so I think that's quite a nice conceptual way to think about where, where what is actually useful. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's real challenges in actually implementing that because of how kind of one level influences the next one. So it's an important question. I do also think when we think about accountability, we are very focused now on the research. What is the merit of the research? And I think sometimes we forget to ask, are we hiring the best researchers? Are we hiring not, and, and really thinking about, is this the per best person for the job role, considering all the things they'll need to do in that job role, not only, the, the research they do and how good that is, but also how well will, will they mentor the next generation? How well will they manage a team if that's part of their role? I do sometimes feel like we are kind of forgetting about that uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a more holistic uh, part of, of the assessment. So, and, and I do think if we want to be accountable, we do also need to show that if we 
acquire funding for a person to do a role that we need to consider all the aspects of that role and whether they'll be suitable for all the aspects of that, that, that role. And I don't know whether we're always doing that at the moment. I, I would argue that probably we're not. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's another thing, like how well our researchers equipped to then lead research teams, um, starting with our postdocs sometimes and then um there's quite a few gaps to fill <laughs> and yeah yeah and i think in a more holistic form of assessment it will be easier to take that into account yeah. um and you know of course we'll still take on the people who have the you know who do the best research but sometimes that will mean someone who has you know is on par with the other candidates but also can show that they have the competencies to lead a team or the competencies to do outreach of, that's an essential part of 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 that specific position um so that's hopefully i'm hoping that that's the direction we'll go in mm. yeah and and also showing that we hire a diversity of people because we can right now to be a successful scientist you really have to fit in that um PI profile, you know, you you are the leader of a research group. Um, you have you you supervise students. You produce a lot of papers, of which you are the fine, the last author. But the middle positions, and the team members, and the the people who help support the projects, they cannot really become independent researchers unless they follow this path. So there's a differentiation of of skills and profiles that is needed and i think that that relates back to do we hire the best researchers it's not just one type of researcher that we need and everybody needs to compete against each other we need good teams strong teams strong collaboration and that requires different profiles and also uh, or are the people who engage in the research capacity equipped with the skills they need to pursue a career within academia, meaning, yeah, what, what stepping stones are needed to also provide as an institution or as a, as a sector, like academia. Yeah. And I would add to that, and also outside academia, because we have to remember for a PhD student, staying in academia is the exception today. Yeah. It's and like, like most PhD students are not aware of that. Like I keep telling them, like most of you guys will find a place outside academia and you have to, but it's also an exciting opportunity. <laughs> but the expectation, including myself, I thought like I didn't even consider there was no, like I didn't have awareness of what's happening after. And like the thoughts I gave to is like, oh, I'll probably become a research group leader and will I be fit for the job? That was my fear rather than an expectation. Um, yeah, and I do think there is still this stigma around failure if if you don't end up being in that one pathway. Um, so the, it, it, there's a lot of links across, uh, and I do think the incentive system plays a big role in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my personal vision for how we can alleviate that is that we actually get much more diversity and much more mobility between sectors so that you can actually, within academia, hear, hear firsthand from a supervisor who has been in industry or who has been in the public sector that you get that mobility. But again, I think as changes will be needed to the assessment system to make that possible. Because obviously at the moment, if you are in the public sector, in industry, elsewhere, where publishing is not a requirement for anything you do, it's almost impossible to have a CV that would get anyone interested in academia. Whereas hopefully if we can move away to some extent from that, there will be merit in understanding the competencies of someone who's been elsewhere and what they can bring to academia. And those could be the kind of mentors who can talk to PhD students about all the other uh, options they have in their career. But now I'm looking very long term. We're not really there yet, but that's I'm hoping that that's the direction we'll, we'll move in. And that will you know also alleviate some of the problems that there are now with transitioning from academia I've done it and it was you know I found it quite difficult it, it was quite a struggle to understand how other sectors work what, what counts in recruitment um, so I do think there's already smaller things we can do today to prepare PhDs and postdocs better for that transition but mm -hmm. I, I do really hope that on, in the long term there will just be much more interconnectedness be between sectors also in terms of the assessment system that those interventions become less uh, less needed. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. <laughs> I think that's a real priority for the future and something we're not there yet. Uh, it, it needs a big culture change, but it's really, really crucial. Yeah, just really coming back to the question or the, the concept of slow science, like I think in a common or my common understanding of academia is that it's less supposedly less stressful, less output oriented, which very much it has become in the past two decades, really. I think it's become extreme. Um, ver like as compared to the industry, which is clearly purp and purposefully committed to developing products and that's therefore has to be output oriented as in producing results which then can be um turned into products or serve society so do you I do, do you see I, I feel that the lines have blurred too much and maybe it's a it's an opportunity also to redefine what academia is supposed to like what role academia is supposed to fulfill where we have so much bioscience and STEM research, which is very much similar, or it's quite similar to industrial research and also engaged with industrial research when it comes to implementable or ap applied research, the, the lines of blood very much, um, more than just two or three decades ago. Um, yeah, what, what is, where is academic freedom in such systems? And can we claim academic freedom back as in, providing space and within academia for conceptualization, for experimenting more than there is in an in industry. Um, which like, what's what's the unique selling point for academia? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, oh, go, so, go, go ahead, go first, Noemi. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say, well, I mean, we're, I agree, like academia is less product oriented, but by by definition, but the product has become the scientific paper. So it, it has become that, yeah, we don't have something to do manufacture and implement straight away, but we have become a paper producing machine and a paper producing industry in a way that this is the goal at the moment for for most careers to 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 do. So it's there's more room to have results that are um, not as applicable, but we still have a problem. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think um, that perception of academia and industry, I, I would say is probably no longer true. Um, and there is indeed the product of the publication that is strived for in academia. And I think in industry, a lot has actually happened probably more on the HR side on, you know, there's lots of requirements where I think a lot of progress has been made in terms of culture not in every company obviously there's in academia as well we're, we're talking about a broad sector um, and we're kind of generalizing what I do think is a big difference from my own experience is that what I've kind of felt as a big difference outside is that there is much more uh, focus on how you contribute to a team effort how you kind of contribute to a collective achieving of objectives, whereas uh, I think academia still is very much focused on individuals and how you as an individual perform. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think that's a big different, a big cultural difference. Uh, and it does make it difficult to, to focus on the team effort and to focus on the, the collaboration. And I think there's lots of conversations around collaboration versus competition, much more in academia, I would say, than in any other sector that I've I've kind of had experiences in. Um, so I also feel to some extent academia is a bit behind in implementing some of the the kind of sometimes in some companies quite progressive mm. initiatives on inclusion and diversity, on good HR practice, on, uh, you know, diversifying the, 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 the kind of the, the type of profiles they need as part of a team. So I do think that um, that is something where. Um, there's there's also lessons to learn, I think, for the academic sector from outside. Equally, I do I do remember the things that I loved about academia. I did love the flexibility. That didn't mean less work pressure because it often meant kind of working all the time. But I, I do remember there was lots of flexibility about how you fill in 
your portfolio, you know, what conferences you choose to go to, um, much less need for sign off from someone, much more flexibility and freedom to, to follow your own interest. And I do think with all the changes that we're proposing, that that is something that's important to preserve, uh, because I do think it's a very attractive element of being an academic that you can uh, make some of those choices. Mm. So, you know, there, there's, I think, also a big challenge now around how do you, how do you kind of, um implement change maybe learn from other sectors where they're ahead but without losing some of those unique really great things uh about academia and that's you know not i don't think something we have an answer um to yet but hopefully we are working towards that mm. right we we said in the beginning that we were talk about um how can we measure success and what is success i think we've touched on a few things here and there but just to you know, just in case the listener was waiting for us to answer that. Um, me, me, and I, I think, like personally, I think it's a personal measure very much, but maybe it can also be institutionalized. So maybe we can each start with our personal measure of success. Um, I had a similar question when it came to happiness. What makes you happy as a professional <laughs> and as a human being? And I just want to mention that like a couple of months ago, I had a podcast with Chris Long, Simone Asaki, Rebecca Kennison. We were looking at um, a values aligned academy. So basically working, so they have published an assessment from United States universities, 12 of them, um, where they asked the university staff, not the researcher, but um, at the librarians um, level mostly. And there was a big complaint that people had lost um, purpose in their work and was very much metrics oriented and uh, metrics assess assessing approaches. Um, and they were hungry for aligning their work again with their value systems, personal value systems. So in that regard, I think now coming back to the question of what, how can we measure success? Isn't it also very much purpose and values oriented? Mm. Um, and shouldn't that also be a measure or a component to address at institutional and standards level? Um, I can start with this just because um, part of my PhD was to look at success in science. So I really, uh, I interviewed uh, several stakeholders. So researchers, research funders, policymakers, PhD students, uh, research staff, like different types of profiles within academia. Mm. And I and we spoke about success in science. And one of the things that I realized uh, very quickly is that people talk about success in careers and then they talk about success in science. And, and to them, it was different. So you have things that you do to survive in your career, to be successful, to become a good researcher to be promoted and there are things that you do to make science advance so uh, for example you collaborate uh, you open up your science um, you take the time to make your results reproducible so this is all advancing science but it's not advancing your career so i i really well, found this situation it will be Thank <laughs> yeah, you. yeah 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 okay. <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely but i i think it so I find it really interesting to talk about success because there's really this dichotomy and that's where you realize we have a problem in mm. assessment. So that links us back to the assessment. Uh, and I think as researchers, our personal perceptions of success is very, it's, it's personal. You know, some people, for my field of research, I work in research assessment, researchers, careers uh, uh, changing academia so my view of success is to actually change something to make something that will have an impact on the system and make academia mm. better in my perspective other people have other goals they want to advance uh, a small field of knowledge or they want to uh, uh, contribute create a network so it, it's very very individual mm. Mm -hmm. I just add an anecdote um, to this because I, I will never forget a, a colleague of mine who was also a PhD student um, where, where I was in the Max Planck and Tübingen uh, a while ago. And it, I think it was three or five years after we completed each of our PhDs. And then he, he was on Facebook 
sorry for uh, rent name dropping, but um, he was he was literally saying, it's not often that I share anything about my work here on Facebook. Usually it's for personal stuff, but. So he was a basic researcher like me and he studied a gene and it turned out that um, uh, other research groups had looked into the gene that he had characterized uh, as a genetics approach um, has has allowed other teams who were looking into child disease to characterize further and then identify the gene being a cause and therefore now being able to develop a treatment for a rare disease in, in, in children. And like when he found that article and his work being cited there, that like, gave him such an unexpected and overwhelming feeling of accomplishment, <laughs> like that he actually contributed to eventually saving or helping making children's lives better. He he couldn't foresee as a basic researcher, but isn't that why we do research? Um, like not knowing what we might contribute to some of us and where there's applied research, having a specific purpose and cause to yeah, to, to pursue. And isn't that also something that we should measure? Like to what extent? Well, not measure in a way, yeah, hopefully mostly qualitative. Like what's the best approach to allow the researcher to, to achieve that goal to for humankind or um, a society in a specific discipline or region of the world to to gain knowledge to do better on this planet with the other species that we share this planet with, but also with, amongst us people. But. And that's a great example that would fit perfectly in a narrative CV. <laughs> and the beauty of it is also, it doesn't refer just to his publication, it refers to others' work. It shows how collaborative it is and how we all indeed can sometimes contribute a small piece of, of a, a much bigger uh, goal. So indeed, I think that's, that's the kind of stories hopefully we'll be able to tell a lot more in the future i mean it's yeah i think it's an interesting question what is success and it is very individual mm -hmm. um to come back to your kind of link with values i think it's worth mentioning that there is this uh, i norms developed this scope framework which is basically a framework to help anyone who does evaluation of research to really reflect on um why they do it how they do it evaluate how they do it um, and it, it does the first uh, kind of scope, the, the S stands for start with what you value. So think first about what is it that you value, then think about how can I evaluate it, test it, probe, and then, you know, evaluate the evaluation itself as well at the end. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a very close connection with, with values. And I think sometimes maybe we, we've forgotten to reflect on that when we set out how we do an evaluation in in. In research, but elsewhere as well, I think that there's a wider story around the mm. thinking about connecting values with assessment. Um, and I think in, in, just personally thinking about success, um, it comes down, I think, to what you say. It's about helping people, first of all, but indeed in a context where it doesn't damage other beings on the planet or the planet itself. Um, and for me, that's definitely a driver in all the work I do. Um, I do hope that it's 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 it helps other people and it helps society more generally, even though it's very small steps. And I think everyone working in research culture knows about the the setbacks that are part of it, the challenges, uh, but also accepting that it is slow steps. Um, and I think what makes me happy in my job is I do very often get messages from people saying, I'm so happy you're working on this, or mm -hmm. it's, you know, so great to see some of the work you're doing. I think that is really helping to keep motivated when you also get the other, the other messages, there's disagreement oh, as well. We've always but, done it this way. It cannot change because that's how we measure. But, yeah. And there is lots of critique and it's understandable because it's, yeah. this is, you know, it's an important topic, but I also often say to people who start in the field, it's good to get critique as well, because if you don't, mm -hmm. there is a question around how important what you're doing is, you know, you're working on a topic where there are different opinions and that's probably a good thing. Yeah, it helps yeah. to sharpen the narrative and to really question if it's the, if it's the best approach we can take to call for change and what's the most efficient way to change without causing too much damage along the way maybe also i think one of the things we've been thinking about is unintended consequences for example 
young researchers will be caught up a bit in a transition where they will need to navigate, okay, what is what is it you're asking from me? What will be now the requirements for career progression? And we'll need to be very careful with that. Um, so I do think there are questions around evaluating what we're doing, making sure we do it together with those who will be assessed. So there's definitely some 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 of that that I uh, I'm very confident that change will be a positive thing in in this uh, in this context. Yeah. yeah, and I think we I mean we have we know we have a problem. So we have if we keep status quo, we we will just keep that problem. So by trying out and being open, there's also a big uh, element of this reform on research assessment that's about revisiting what we've changed and how it changed the system has it improved or not that's mm -hmm. also really important to consider and just to come back on early career researchers and and what we were discussing about success I mean I think there's a broad agreement uh, about success being something that that helps society that helps the world but we also have to be careful that for early career researchers this may come in 15 20 years so we also have to have measures in place ways of acknowledging for future success that does not exist yet so that we don't forget the early career researchers those who are starting it and do not have anything to show or didn't have any influence on, in policies or or in uh, major documents at the moment because they just started mm. right so um cool okay how can we conclude this i think what <laughs> Maybe also we we to conclude on the most possible positive note, and I think we're on a good path um, because the change is here. It's on. It's it's happening. It's ongoing. We're just you know um, um, rearranging the puzzle to make it, every piece fit again in a new format. There's there's many. Well, there's not really standards that can be established on a meta level, but incentives that are being incentives and assessment points or items. I don't know how to what the taxonomy would be, but um, I think the awareness raising has happened. So thanks to Dora and other like minute and similar initiatives, the need for change is obvious, um, and most people I would assume are willing. So what maybe to conclude for this um, episode, what are what is one or if we want two or three things that we all as researchers on whatever capacity you want to focus on now as a take-home message, what can we do, each of us, um, as in climate change, you know, just shower less or whatever. <laughs> like, anyways, um, so what are simple steps that we can all do to help um, the change happening and to also support ourselves in our own career prospects along the way maybe just one or I can, two yeah i can i mean start with, with one or two so i think one thing that everyone in the research system definitely can do is help to change the narrative one example that i really like is a lot of questions when researchers talk to each other are still very much driven by the incentive system. So I remember conversations where someone said, mm -hmm. I published the paper, you know, we're celebrating, and the immediate response would be in which journal? Yeah. You, know, you can ask a different question. You can ask what's the research about, you know, who will it be important to, or is there other groups who, you know, you know, you will build on it? Have you been in touch? There's just many other questions you can ask. And I think that will really already help change the narrative. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a small thing everyone can do. Um, and then I think a second thing is, um, we've talked about lots of examples of, I think, good practice and, and initiatives that are ongoing. Everyone can, can help raise awareness with colleagues within their institution. So I would say those are already, I think, two starting points that every researcher can, uh, can contribute to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. So these are, I think these are the best examples that we can all relate to. So talking about it um, is really important and trying to think about the way you think about it uh, as well. So just for, for example, one of the things that I noticed through my work, so I'm someone who 
studied and work in success in science, issues of the scientific system, well-being of researchers. And then I realized that in my work habits, my work practice, I'm someone who overworks, who works evenings, who works uh, weekends and all of these things. I'm sort of promoting what I say should not happen in science. So questioning our own practice, sometimes putting what we do on the table and asking ourselves, does that fit with my value of science with what I value in science does it does what I do actually give fits with my rationale of what I want of science uh, so it's sometimes good to have these personal reflections and to make changes in how you do research and how you are with yourself mm. yeah I think that's another major I call it a misconception because also for me, there was the understanding if you want to, if you are a scientist and you want to be successful, you need to give it 150%, if not 200%, meaning working weekends. And there's also an unwritten rule in many institutions. Like, of course, you come in on a weekend if it's just for two or three hours, often seven. <laughs> and I didn't question that. It didn't occur to me to question that. I just felt eventually I'm exhausted. Also, to take holidays for me wasn't really a priority just because the pressure was so real and not that I often realize, but you know, I think that's also an issue with academia and the culture that we have and expectations and unwritten or often spoken like, or also the way, like, are you sure you can take a holiday at this stage in your research? Like, are you sure? <laughs> like, can you not do that later once you've written that manuscript? And that might take a few months. <laughs> like, mm. I mean, uh, yeah, to establish a healthy work-life balance, whatever that now means for everyone, but to make, like, we are now machines, we're not robots, we're human beings, and we are biological systems that need to um, recharge. Like, we also run on energy <laughs> in our bodies. And we need mm -hmm. to eat and uh, and have conversations outside the research context and nurture friends and family relations. And all of that is important in life and also for us as human beings to keep us happy because there's also a whole section in this podcast about well-being, keep us happy and also functioning again in the research context and therefore purpose-driven, oriented and purpose-functional in a way to yeah. serve as researchers it links all together right yeah okay but i think yeah i i think we have the advantage that these rules are not written so we have we have yeah. an opportunity to rewrite them yeah the way that suits like researchers and research. let's just build a different culture of narrating how we want to work in academia and as scientists and mm -hmm. I think we're, yeah, the awareness is here. We we know open science also reminds us of the values that are important and are fully aligned with research integrity and um, best research practices as they've been postulated two or three decades ago in various institutions. So we're good, we're set. It's just doing the work and implementing. Oh, I already know. Okay, thank so you. We'll, yeah. Sorry? We'll get there. Yeah, I'm seeing that's the hard bit. We will get there <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and we are the change. So, like each of us, also the listeners, not only the three of us. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for joining me today for this, and speak soon. Thank, thank you. you.